This is the second in a series of two videos having to do with how we think about steel, standard steel trusses as part of integrated systems. Uh, in this case, we're going to focus on roofs. And as part of that, we're going to look at structure, duct work, and daylighting. So first of all, we'll look at trusses below the roof daylighting aperture. So this would be a classic example. Um, this is the a retrofit which was done on an existing building for the headquarters of the Body Shop Corporation. There's a vertical south-facing glass with baffles, or in this case, uh, banners, movable banners that are uh, translucent so they are able to diffuse the light in all directions and then north glazing to sort of keep a more level amount of light in the space. In this case the uh, monitor is resting on these two key points in the truss. This is not the way you would normally do it. You'll notice that the top cord is actually passing through um, the space so there's no decking on it to stabilize it laterally so additional bracing is required to keep this uh, top cord which is in compression from buckling to the side but it was done on this particular structure because we wanted north and south facing glass and the structure was running from north to south and so basically when we raised the monitor up the bracing of the top cord was lost. But nonetheless, it turned out to be a pretty effective retrofit design that has produced steady levels of good quality light for a client that's very satisfied with it. It's not what we would do though if we were designing a structure from scratch, and it's particularly not what we would do if we want to provide any kind of fireproofing for the roof structure. So here's an example of what we could do if we wanted to do that. We could move some of these uh, truss joists closer together and then produce a larger gap on the other side. Um, and then we could contain pairs of these uh, truss joists inside some sort of ceiling, which we've sloped on each side. So this slot right here represents where the roof monitor or the daylight aperture is going to go. And this material that's encasing these trusses could be sheetrock and could be fireproofed to protect that structure. Um, what's even more elegant in a way is rather than have two trusses that have to be braced together and um, that bracing uh, costs money and interferes with certain other things you might want to do with this structure. For example, here we've got ductwork coming down between those two trusses. So we have to figure out how to get those two trusses to work together to brace each other. And the only way to do it is some sort of rigid frame structure that keeps them from flipping out from underneath the load. So this scheme works and it works pretty well. So here we have feeder ducts coming down here and there and the option for using this other bay in some other capacity. But we end up with a flat ceiling there and sometimes that flat ceiling feels a little dark and a little gloomy. And so what we can do is we can take two of these trusses and we can slope them and basically create a tubular truss down the center line. So that would look something like this. And in this case we've made both the girders and the joist uh, tubular trusses. And this is an example of how that would look. In this case, we've got long slots. Um, in the case of this particular model, we've got crisscrossing or intersecting uh, triangular cross-section tubular trusses. Um, and the ducts go up inside like so. And then you'll notice in this case, a ceiling is being installed with these coffers and those coffers provide the fireproofing for the structure. Now we can actually put trusses up in the roof daylighting apertures and that's a way of getting uh, much greater structural depth and structural efficiency because when we add the structure down below 
we're adding to the overall depth of the structure. Whereas when we put it in an aperture that already had to be deep for daylighting purposes, um, we uh, basically reduce the overall depth of the structure. So this would be a classic example that we've looked at before. Here we have a truss up in the aperture. It's a pretty deep aperture and the truss is quite deep and that's very structurally efficient. And as a consequence, it doesn't add anything to the depth of the structure that didn't have to be there for daylighting purposes. In this case, by the way, there are additional um, volumes here that serve as ductwork for the system. Here is another version. In this case, we've got either north or south facing uh, sawtooth. Uh, sometimes we like to mix north and south glass because the north glass tends to even out the light and the light from the south aperture can be highly variable. So in this case, we've got trusses in the south aperture, trusses in the north aperture, again, trusses in the south aperture and trusses in the north aperture. And in this particular case, we've shown a triangular truss here that defines a kind of spine through this building. And that triangular truss again has south and north glazing and south and north glazing, but it's popped up in this triangular form to suggest a sort of centrality of that portion of the building and a special significance that's resulted in its being popped up higher. Again, though, for any given zone, the glazing area should be about 20% total, uh, meaning that the area of north and south glass combined is equal to about 20% of the floor area. So this is what that looks like with the lower roof and the upper roof and the lower roof and the upper roof. You'll notice there's a slope to get water off of this zone in this particular scheme, this portion was not sloped towards the outside of the building because it's presumed that water can run off of each side down into this gully that's uh, constituted by the lower portion of the roof. This is just another rendering of that same basic concept. Um, so this is dealing with the uh, triangular truss zone. And by the way, in this particular building, you'll notice we've shown the bottom cord of the truss running here and the bottom cord there. So it's a true parallel cord truss. And uh, this, this lower structure is basically hung off of that in the form probably of a continuous web member. So the vertical web members can come down to support the lower portion of the roof. Um, this doesn't take full advantage of the potential depth of that truss though. So we're going to look at this as an alternate scheme. So here we have a column line and a column line and a roof truss. And you'll notice that the roof truss now, instead of just being the depth of the aperture, has been extended down to almost twice as much depth. So in the previous diagram, we were putting the bottom cord at the bottom of the aperture, basically. And in this truss, we're putting the bottom cord down here. So instead of putting the bottom cord there, we've moved it all the way down. So for this particular uh, scheme, we have roughly doubled the depth of our truss, which is good because we have glass in this truss and making it really deep and really stiff is pretty crucial to um, allowing the glass to reside there without uh, deflection that would cause the glass to be uh, shattered or damaged. Now you'll notice here that our sloped roof is right along here. And then this is a really thick rigid insulation, which is in this case, seven inches, because that's what the thermal code is leading us to uh, in the current version. And for the foreseeable future, it'll be about seven inches of rigid styrofoam insulation. Um, it's really important to you as architecture students that you get used to this idea that insulation is not a trivial part of your structure 
or your design. It's a major thickness and you need to account for that when you do your design. So here we have decking and rigid insulation and then the top surface where there's a recovery board and probably some kind of single ply membrane. Now you'll notice that this top surface slopes downward to let the water run off. So we start with a four inch curb at this end and we go to something more like an 11 and a half inch curb at that end, which is exactly what we want because as water flows down this trough, it gets deeper and deeper because there's more cumulative water coming off the roof. So we'd like a deeper curb and a deeper volume at this end and a shallower volume at that end. This is a sectional view through that roof. So in this case, we've put two monitors in the spacing of those, each one of those monitors is 15 inches, 15 feet wide. So all of this would fit on a 30 by 30 column grid. Now, because that truss is so deep, it turns out we can span 60 feet if we want to. And the truss is a little bit deeper now because this slope surface, which has to be a slope of about one and four, if we run twice as far with it, it has to go down twice as much. So if we have a seven and a half inch drop for a 30 foot run, then for a 60 foot run, we need a 15 inch drop. So we've added seven and a half inches to the overall depth of this truss, but this truss is uh, quite deep. Um, and in this case, it's like almost six feet deep and we're spanning 60 feet. So it's uh, roughly 11 to one in its depth, its length to depth ratio. So it's a, it's a pretty deep uh, proportion and a very sturdy and stiff truss which as we said is what we want because we've gl got glass up in that aperture and we can't afford a lot of deformation that might crack the glass. The other interesting thing to note here is that because of this slope surface, we not only have a trough on the top that gets deeper near this end where the water is exiting from the roof, but we have a volume underneath that slope surface for air transport. So, if this end is where air is injected from, say, that center line of the building, so we'll go back here, and if we say some, somehow we have a trunk line along here, and that trunk line is injecting air in this direction, then it's injecting where that volume is the greatest, and then water, air is uh, bled off from that system through diffusers, and by the time you get to this end, you don't need very much volume because basically you've already heated or cooled the entire space. So this business of putting the truss up in the aperture turns out to be an extremely effective way of keeping the overall height of the structure to some reasonable amount while at the same time incorporating uh, a really nice daylighting system. So that ends our video on systems integration of roofs incorporating standard steel trusses where we've looked at how do we um, integrate structure, ductwork, and daylighting.